We have a voice. And that voice is our life. Have you lost your voice? That means have you lost your life? Have you lost your purpose? Have you lost your cause? A couple of weeks ago I talked to you about the cause. But we are here for a cause. You will never know the true meaning of life until you discover your cause. David was a shepherd boy. David was anointed as king. But that was not that that wasn't the end of the story, and that's just the beginning. And still did not it did necessarily did not give him the meaning to life until he saw the cause and the and the, and the and the time of the connection of the cause was when he realized when he went to the battlefield just to be a, a cheese sandwich cheese pizza delivery boy on the day to his brothers and he saw the giant he says he said we can take on this giant because the lord has been with me the lord is going to be with me he found his cause and his brother said why are you here are you just coming here just to mess around with us wasting no is he and he told his brothers a prophetic word something that he saw that none of the brothers saw who were in the battlefield. He said, I am here for a cause. He says, aren't we here for a cause? And he said, is there not a cause? And Jesus said when he questioned, for this cause I have come. For this reason. See, you and I are on this earth, not just as a mere existence, but you and I are here for a cause. Amen. And the cause is found not in a seminar. That, that cause is found not in a meeting. It's found in faithfulness. While David was so faithful on the field and doing what his father wanted him to do. His father told him, take this cheese sandwich to your brothers. And he was so faithful doing that. And while he did that, he found his cause in serving and living. And that's when, you see, you can be all anointed, you can be all gifted, but if you're not found your cause in life, it's all useless. He was already anointed king. But you see, it was not until he found the cause. And when he said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause in life? Is there not a reason for our lives, my brothers? Is there not a reason for my living, my brothers? Is it when, when, when we have found that, and when you have found that, the anointing will begin to flow. The anointing will never flow in your life until or unless you have found a cause. Because the anointing needs something to work with in your life. Come on. God is waiting. God's looking. You see, the Holy Spirit, Bible tells us, Genesis 1, 1, the Holy Spirit was moving around. He was hovering. That means he had no place because there was chaos. Right? The world was, the world was without form. It was lost. It was, it was chaotic. And the word was spoken. And, and, and God said, let there be light. And the Holy Spirit began to operate on the word that was spoken spoken that was a cause for the Holy Spirit to operate on and when it began to operate and, and when it was day and night and it began to work a miracle you see what happened is God is unless there is a cause the anointing that God has placed upon your life will never come to true effect and the impact to be felt you see, you see, you can see, you can be anointed, you can feel the presence of God, but the cause, the reason that God has called you, the reason that God has you are in this world, not just an existence, but here to make a difference. Amen. And that's why I want to ask you, have you lost your voice? Have you lost your life? Have you lost... The very reason that God has you here. Are you just alive or are you living? Are we just here, just doing the same thing? Yes, a lot of things, you see, see the work of the thing, we've been talking about the presence of God, but the work of the presence of God, what God does is in our mundane things, in our daily routines, and that's where God comes and works a miracle in your life. Amen. It's the daily thing. You came here, amen, not because you got to heal, Alvin. You are in the process of getting healed. But you came, now I'm going to the house of the Lord. Amen, I'm glad to do that. In the process of it, I don't see your crutches. No more, no more crutches. That's, see, the process, you get healed, amen. That's what happens. You took a faith. You could have brought a crutch. You could have brought a crutch, but he said, no, I'm, I'm leaving a crutch at home. One I got to. Yes, sir. I'm working. You're working. <laughs> you worked for two days. And then you had a stroke, all right? And, and, and I remember we went to the airport. You came from the airport. You were, you were the crutch. And last week, you stood up. This is a miracle of God. 
and the disciples praying about you know desperation and person. That's what it is, amen. Yes. And you're already working for two days, yes. amen. Is is that possible, Alan? Is it possible? You know, friends, you know, musicians who have had that kind of, you know, is, is it possible? Most of them have given up, huh? haven't they? They've given up. It's because there's an atmosphere of miracles in this place. Amen. That the atmosphere, you know, he's put himself in an atmosphere. There's a crowd, there's a, there's a group of people in this place who are encouraging. Come on, Albert, you can do it. Amen. God can work a miracle in your life. God can, and he will. Hallelujah. God can. I know your, your fingers are moving as fast as it, it, it should be. But how, you know, but the thing is, is you started somewhere. Hallelujah. You see, the thing is, is when you, you see, the cause is you found faith to be released. Anointing of the presence of God will not be in effect in your life until or unless you, you exercise your faith in the very things that God has called you to do. See, and you and I, we have a reason for our living, reason for our, uh, for, for our existence. Uh, and, and, and the Bible tells us in the, in the book of Isaiah that you are not all created for the glory of God. For the glory of God. I want to look at today in a very, uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's in the book of uh, uh, 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18, there's uh, the story of uh, uh, Elijah, Elijah, but of course Elijah is introduced in the 17th chapter when he proclaims and prophesies about a drought in the land and, he, uh, and God takes him out of that, uh, uh, from, from, the, from the level of uh, prophetic ministry to the uh, to time of solitary where he is in, in, in time with God and seeking the Lord and now God brings him back again in the 18th chapter to declare that the drought was over and it's time for the rain. Hallelujah. Brother Son did not know what I was going to preach. He said he talked about the rain. But the thing is this, I'm not just talking about the rain today, but do you know when the rain comes? Have you, have you heard us say, the, how many of you hear the sound of abundance rain? Have you said that before? Yes? yes. With God, we hear the sound prophetically. Sound of abundant rain. You see, the sound of abundant rain is only heard by people who make a stand. Who have a voice. Who have a life. And live the life that God has given. And I'm, I, 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 I'm, I, can't, I gave you a thought of a few steps ahead. Because I just wanted to prepare you for a moment. You see, we want the rain, but we don't want to make the sacrifice. We want the rain, but we still want to hang out with the majority. We want the rain, but we don't want we, we want to go uh, we, we don't want to go against the grain. We want the we want the grain we, we, we want the rain, but we want we don't want to challenge the status quo. We want the rain, and we also want to be accepted. We want the rain, and we also want to win the popularity contest. Come on. Yes. It cannot be done that way. You want the rain, you'll find it why you have the rain. I'm not going to talk about the rain, but you see right after the story that I'm talking about, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. But it rains because one man's decision. Do you know one person can make the difference? One man, right here, the story that we're talking about today, made a difference and changed everything about in that city. One man, Paul the Apostle, in the book of Acts, if you read it, one man brought down Goddess Diana in the book of Ephesians, in the city of Ephesus. He, one man brought the Goddess Diana down where the whole city was worshiping. One man did it. So one person can change a city. Come on, don't get quiet. Why the presence of God is with you? What? Was it an army that brought down Goliath? Was it an army? The whole army was sitting, even Saul was sitting down. Saul was more, much stronger than David. Saul was more experienced than David. Saul was more skillful than David. David was a little boy, a 16, 17 year old boy. And, he, and he, all he knew was the presence of God. Like my uh, young man right there, Joel was talking about is the presence of God, is a romance of God, is a relationship with God. All that he knew was God has been with me when I fought the lion, when, when the bear came came to eat, eat, eat the sheep that I was tending to. My God, His presence was, was with me. And in my presence, if the presence of God was with me during those difficulties, my presence of God is with me right now, fighting the Goliath of my life. Amen. I want to ask you this afternoon, that there are 
are challenges, there are difficulties, there are things that come our way. And here, just like David, amen, he, he sees them all and he got out. Amen, but the thing, it was the presence of God that changed, that made the difference. Hallelujah. It's the presence of God that was with him and strengthened him. You see, all his brothers were even stronger than David. When his brothers were, were much better than him in appearance. But one man, one young David, brought down Goliath. One man, Paul, changed the whole city of Ephesus from, from idolatry to serving the most high living God. If God can use one man, how much more can God use a group of people today, amen? amen. You know, as, as long as you, you let the presence of God in your life, there's nothing that can stop you. You are unstoppable, amen? You are unstoppable. You are, you, you are like, a, you know, nobody can stand in the way. No one can. Because the greatest force, the greatest power, the greatest uh, empowerment is in your life. And that is the presence of the Most High Living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, if you and I were given the order from the number one person in Hong Kong, See why Leon gives us a, your certification. Whatever you want to do, Alvin, whatever you want to do, go and do it in Hong Kong. Whatever job you want, any sector, go and do it. Will you be thinking twice? No. You, you go to the best job, the greatest job, the, the best paying job, and you walk in and say, give me my job. You won't, be, you won't be asking them, you'll be telling them. Why? You're walking in there with confidence. Because the, 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 the highest authority in the land that you dwell has given you access and has given you the right to what you need and what you desire, what you want. And the greatest power on earth, the greatest power in the universe, the greatest power ever, amen, dwells in us. Hallelujah. The resurrection power of Christ, the Bible tells us, dwells in each and every one of us. Amen. amen. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in us. And here in the story, Elijah comes up again, and God brings him up to the forefront to declare once again nationally about a rain that's going to come about. And as a rain comes about, and he and he's begin to talk, talk to Ahab about it, and he finds out that, the, that Jeze Jezebel has been killing all the prophets of God. And he gets mad at it. And how many of you know it's good to be mad, but it's better when you have a godly anger. Amen. Hallelujah. I pray that we have a godly anger. I pray, I pray that we have a godly uh, God, godly intolerance. Amen. That's what we need. You know, it, uh, oh, we're just tolerant people. No, no. We need to have godly intolerance. Amen. That's what we need. We cannot tolerate those things because we are godly people. We are holy people. We are a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. And here, in verse 19 and 18 chapter of 1 Kings, it reads this way. And he says, Now therefore sent and gathered to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the uh, groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So, so all these ones were the ones who were working for Jezebel, and they were killing the prophets of God. All right, verse 20. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Let me just pause it for a moment. What he's saying is, I want, I want you to come. I want you to, uh, I want you to come and right now, and I want you. We're going to have a showdown. We're going to have a showdown. And he gives them all the instruction. Later on, you see that they're going to have two, two, uh, uh, two bulls, and and and, and the, the, both of them are going to sacrifice. Elijah will sacrifice, and the prophets of Baal will sacrifice. And you call upon your God, and I'll call upon my God. And whichever God answers by fire is the God, is a true and living God. But even before they have, look at the confidence of this man. Look at the confidence of this man. But even before any demonstration, look at what Elijah does. He makes a stand for God. He makes a stand for God. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if you want rain in your life, you've got to make a stand for God in your life. There's no abundance of rain for anyone who doesn't make a stand for God. Yes, 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 yes. Elijah. 
Elijah single-handedly is, is taking on 450 prophets, single-handedly. He doesn't have a leadership meeting right here. He doesn't bring all the, all the prophets of the nation. No. It's time for us to decide. Can I just talk to you straight this afternoon? This is not high, you know, huge revelation or anything. It's going to be very simple, straight talk to you this afternoon. I want to ask you today, who do you serve? Who are you serving? Who are you serving? Who are you living for? Are you just an existence? All you want is just to be in existence? You've come to church so long. I've heard this so many times. Now I've been to church so many times. I mean, in church doesn't do good for me. Now, I've been to church all my life while I was a kid. I grew up, my parents brought me. You know, I've been to church for many years, and church does me no good. I've heard all the messages, it does me no good. Have you heard anything like that before? Yeah. Or have you heard yourself like that before? No. <laughs> Let me ask you something. What's the day today? Help me out, I'm a little bit jet lag. What's that? 18, that's right. 18th of September, right? Oh, okay, September, right? <laughs> I don't know if it was August, October, okay, 18th of September. Can I ask you something? 2015, September 18th, what did you eat? 2014, September 18th, what did you eat? What kind of rice? What kind of noodles? Were you fasting? You should have been fasting. <laughs> Five years ago, a day from today, what were you eating? Don't tell me rice. I want details. You don't remember, do you? No. I don't remember what the preacher preached five years ago either. Yes. No. Obviously, it has helped me to live for God until today. I do not know what I ate five years ago. I don't know what I ate and what I ate ten years ago. But whatever I've been eating has been keeping me, keeping me alive, and I'm still alive today. So many times we think, oh, I go to church, I hear these sermons, I do all this. It does, it does you good. It has kept you going. Amen. Is that right? Yeah. What did you eat a week ago? Ah, oh, we don't even remember. Name all the three meals. Don't give me rice, rice, rice. <laughs> That's what happens when I go to Philippines. That's what you eat wine, rice, rice, rice. If you go to, if I'm talking to a, a, a Hispanic community, they'll say tacos. But they eat tacos in the morning, tacos in the afternoon, and tacos at night. Yes. See, what I'm saying is this. Many times we will not feed it. We will not have that, that, that kind of, wow, you know, the, you know the, every single, but see, every single meal that we, we, we partook in the, and we brought into our body, it helped us to live longer. It provided the nourishment that we needed on the day at the time. So right now, you will never listen to, ne never retain much of this message even today. But obviously, it's going to nourish you enough to keep you going. Amen. 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 If I were to ask you when, what, what did John Malcolm preach three years ago, even John Malcolm does not remember. <laughs> but obviously, whatever it is, even when it was good, it kept you going. Amen. Hopefully, it's on a fast food. Hopefully. Hopefully, it is. It was good nourishing. Hopefully it was healthy. Hopefully it was good. There was enough nutrients in that message, in that word of God. You see, sometimes we say, well, it does, it does you, it keeps you going. We don't understand that. We don't remember every meal that we ate, but we don't we do know one thing for sure. It kept you going. It, it helped you to wake up next day to go to school, to go to work, to do whatever activity that you were involved in. See, it's time for us, church, that you are not people who are, who don't stand for nothing will fall for everything. If you don't stand for nothing, you will fall for everything. Will you help me to tell the person next to you? If you don't stand for nothing, you will fall for everything. That's right. And that's, that, I believe that's a call. And I pray that the church today, you and I as church, as Calvary Church, today that we have not lost our voice. There's a voice that the Bible tells us crying out in the desert talking about John the Baptist preparing the way of the Lord. We are a voice, not an echo. We are a voice with clarity, with precision, with, with accuracy, pronouncing that, that, that there is a, our Savior. He's coming back. See, John the Baptist talked about the first, about the first coming. We are, we, are, we are preparing the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
We are preparing the way for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there is a voice that's crying out. Not an echo, not somebody said this. We're trying to echo some, somebody else's revelation. No, I believe with all my heart. Church, what are we standing for? Let me ask you, ladies and gentlemen, young people, what are you standing for? What do you stand for? When people look at you, they should know what you stand for before they even open their mouth and before you even open your mouth. People should know the way you live. People should know how, can, how much they can talk to you, what they can talk to you, what kind of language they, 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 you know, they, they use when they talk to you because of the, of the man, the woman that you are, because of the stand that you made. And here he's saying, if, 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 if Baal is your God, sir, can I say this same thing to us today? If you're not convinced about Christianity, don't be a Christian. Pastor, how can you say that? I can't say that because I said it to my family first. My, my wife and I, we talk to our children. We tell them, you want to serve God, you serve, but don't ever play church. Don't play God. Don't play God. If you want to live for God, live for God. If you don't want to live for God, don't live for God. Make up your mind. Simple. We tell that to our own children. And before, because we preach to our own family first, I'm sorry, I can say that to this family. Make up your mind. Don't put one foot on that church and serving God and one foot on the world. No. Don't put your foot on six days in the world and one day in church. Put both the foot in the world. Enjoy the world. If you find pleasure in sin, go ahead and enjoy sin. Enjoy it. Enjoy it until you die. I'm serious, church. I'm not playing games here. If you, if you want to live in sexual immorality, enjoy it. If you live in vices, Enjoy it. Don't, 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 don't live in a way for six days and one day for two hours and you're lifting up holy hands. You're not pleasing anybody here. No. You can trick me, you can trick the people in the church, but you can't trick God. God knows better than that. Don't be of two opinions here. But if you want to live for God, live for God. Give your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service unto the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. If you want to live for God, live for God. If you want to live for God, make sure your mind is holy, your heart is holy, your hands are holy, your legs are holy, your whole being is holy. That you live for Him all through the week, every single day. But don't play games. You know why? You will suffer. If you want to live in rebellion, live in rebellion if that's what you want. But if you want to change, humble yourself in the, in, in the sight of God and let God work in you, through you, and change you and transform you. And exactly the same thing is that how long will you be of two opinions? The Bible tells us a man who's unstable, a, a man who is double minded, is unstable, not in, in one of his ways, but in all of his ways. If you're not, if you don't, if you haven't, if you don't have a made up mind, you're going to be unstable in every single area. Not just in your spiritual life, in your finances you'll be unstable, in your relationships you'll be unstable, in your health you'll be unstable, every aspect of your life you'll be unstable. That's what the book of James says. A man who is double minded is unstable in all his ways. Can we make up our mind? Who are we going to serve? Don't play games with God. Don't play games with your life. You know why? It's a life given to you by God. When you play games with your life, you're mocking God. Yes. Yes. You are not, you're saying, God, what you've given me is not a big deal. I can do whatever you want, I want. I can mess up my life the way I want. No, your life is a gift from God to you. Don't be of two opinions. He said, be, and he said, if the Lord be God, follow him. And if Baal, then follow him. And then answer not a word. You see, this world has a lot of things to shout about today. We have a lot of things to say about, but actually nobody stands for anything. Yes, they do. It seems like that. But when it really comes down, you see, they answer not a word. The past week or so, we've been uh, away, uh, attended uh, 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 Debbie's wedding and Damon's wedding. What a beautiful wedding. And it's just God is thinking a lot. You know, when I say the word gay, 
What's the first thing that comes to your mind? It's about two men, isn't that right? Isn't that about two men? Help me out. If you, if, if you Google the word gay, what does gay mean? The, one of the first definitions that comes out is a relationship of two men, of homosexuality. But do you know the word gay is a biblical word? It goes as far as the 12th century. It's derived from the French word guy, G-A-I. And even before that, I know the French and the German won't accept this, but this even derives from the German word from the 12th century. The, 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 the King James was written in the 16th century. And the word is used in the, in the King James Bible. And it means happy, joyful, glad. And we have lost the word gay to homosexuality. And so I'm asking you, have we lost our voice? How many more words are we going to use, lose? Today, when, uh, the generation that we are raising up right now, young people already say, oh, gay. Oh, we laugh about it. Oh, it's, about, it's not. And we don't say, I am gay. Oh, you are gay? Because we are afraid. Listen to some of the old carols, Christmas carols. The word gay is used as happy, joyful. I forgot which cow is it, but I know, I know uh, the number of them. We are losing our ground, church. We are losing our ground. If I say the word meditation, we have lost the word meditation too. Do you know that? Yes. The Christians, we have lost. The Bible tells us meditate on the word day and not doing meditation, sitting down and doing yoga or some new, uh, new, you know, new age kind of thing. Yeah. What are you doing? Oh, I'm in yoga. Oh, I'm doing this stuff. Oh, I'm in a trance meditation. Oh, I'm in that. This, I'm doing that. I'm doing my whatever. I'm meditating. And, but we don't meditate the word of God. It seems like we're taking the word meditation from the new age or whatever the people are doing outside and bringing it into Christianity, not realizing we gave the word up. We are meditating on all other kind of nonsense while they are taking the word meditate. Meditate talks of me, me thinking about it. Meditate also means speaking it. Mutter. Utter. Can you see? We have lost ground somewhere. We lose the word gay. We lose the word meditation. What got me really sick this time? Even more others out there. Is rainbow. You type out rainbow. It comes an association with homosexuality and LB, LGBTQ, whatever the thing is. Listen here. Listen, please hear me. Rainbow. We were staying in a hotel where we were going to, uh, where, we, where the wedding was going to take place in the city, which is about 15 minutes away. Right next to our hotel was a, a homosexual lesbian bar, wasn't it? It was. And they had a rainbow outside, and the name of the pub was called Rainbow Pub. Okay, and it disturbed me. Not so much about the people. No, I, I, don't have, I love homosexuals. I love the gay. Because God loves them. God loves them. I grew up with some of them. They were, they were in my classes. They were in my school. So I don't have an issue with that. About what, I have an issue with what they are involved in. Yes. But God loves them. God cares for them. So do I. But what really upset me was not so much about the people in there, but what has been robbed from the Bible. When you say the rainbow, rainbow is a covenant given to God, from God to man. Yes. He loves us. He cares for us. You know, we've been traveling a little bit in the past few months, and one of the beautiful things that we have seen is rainbows. And one time my wife spotted double rainbows. I said, wow, I've never seen a more and more when I look at that. What a beauty. What a promise from God. A covenant to God that God loves his people. Yes, he loves the gays. Yes, he loves. But you see, the thing is, now they're taking, now we have associated rainbow with, uh, with, with gays and homosexuality. And not even realizing that I have a covenant with God. Church, what else are we going to lose? Are we going to lose the cross soon? Are we going to lose the cross soon? Somebody is going to come up with some kind of thing and say, cross, that's what this means. Let me tell you, if we lose the cross, we have lost everything. 
We are losing little by little. Do you know that? But you're turning it. I'm, I'm just scratching the surface right here. Not even scratching it. I'm hardly even getting into it. So many things that we have lost to this world. And the world claims that this is. The world is using Christmas for their own selfish gain and selfish uh, reasons and for, for economy and for, for, for their own, uh, for their own uh, businesses. Using Christ, using Jesus, using Christmas, using Easter. Where Easter, the body is bigger than Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us. The eggs are even more colorful and more exciting than Jesus Christ himself. We are losing somewhere, amen. Have we lost our voice? Have we lost our life? Let me ask us this. Those things don't start in the church. Those things don't start in the church. It starts at a home. As a family, as a husband and wife, as, a, as children, what do you stand for? What do we stand for? Are we still between two opinions? This or that? Do I go to church or not? No. Why do we even think about it? Whether we should go to church after so long? Are you with me this afternoon? Yes. Is, it, is it still a question in our home? Whether we should go to church today? Is it still a question? If it's still a question after being a Christian for a while, you don't have a made up mind. Then you might as well make up, you might as well enjoy your Sundays. Go for dim sum. Go to the beach. Enjoy yourself. Don't bother coming to church. Enjoy it. You see, people who have made up mind are the ones who are going to experience the rain. People who have made a mind, they're going to make a stand for God. Then you are not part of the majority. You might be the minority and the minority be only you. You are the one who's going to make a difference. You are the one who will bring a blessing into this wicked generation. You are the one who's going to bring a blessing into this nation. You are the one who's going to bring a blessing into the place where you live, in the place where you work. You are going to be the, bring the abundance of rain where you are. It's because of you, because of your stand, because of your faith. You alone can make a difference. You alone will be the difference. You can pray for the rain. And the rain will never come. Because you stand for nothing. Because God will never send a rain for the sake of sending one. Okay, let me just turn on the shower a bit from heaven and let me let it rain down. No. But the Hollywood that doesn't make sense. The rain is for those who make a stand. And Elijah prophetically said, it's going to rain. It was not through any other prophets. Keep in mind, I didn't have time to read it, but earlier on, one of the servants of uh, of, of, uh, of Ahab was Obadiah. Obadiah was a good man. Was a, was, a, was a man who loved God, feared God. And he saw Jezebel was killing all the God's servants. So what he did was he took 50 of them, put in one cave, and took the other 50 and put them on the other cave and protected them. And he protected them from anything, you know, from, uh, from, from getting killed. And, and he, he, was, he was trying to save them, was trying to uh, help them out, you know, and, and trying to uh, preserve Trying to kill them from anything, uh, you know, from getting killed by Jezebel. And, and that story leads on to this story that we are reading. And then when it goes on to say, what's 21, what's 22 tells us this? And said Elijah unto thee, I, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Hold on a second. Elijah said, I, only I, remain a prophet of the Lord. Is that a true statement? No. Yes and no. no. Yes. It is true and it is also not yes and no. The answer is both yes and no. <laughs> yes, it is because no one else was standing up. No, because there were other ones who were hidden in the cave. Today, too many chickens, I mean too many Christians are hiding in the cave. 
Yes, they were put back there so that they can be protected. But somebody has to say, you know what? I'm going to rise up. If I die, I die. I die for the cause. Yes. Amen. Amen. I die for the cause. It doesn't matter. I'm going to put my life on the line. Problem is this. A lot of people today want to die for Christ, but nobody wants to live for Christ. Yeah. See, when you're dead, God cannot use you. If you're alive, God can use you. Amen. So no point saying, you know, when I'm dead, I'm going to come to church. Don't worry, when you're dead, you will come to church because there will be service for you. <laughs> come to church, you're alive. You can help in so many different ways. You can help the living. God, God is in the midst of the living. Amen. He works among the living. He can use the living. Hallelujah. Amen. He says, yes, it's true, but sometimes it feels like nobody is making a stand. What, what, what Elijah was saying, it, it seems like an exaggerated statement. But also at the same time, it is a true statement too. He says, it's only I. How many of you know sometimes you have felt that way? In your office, at home. Sometimes you have felt you're the only one who's living for God. Correct? He's the only one there, but there are other Christians in your office. There are other Christians that are not. Because you know they're not making a stand for God. I can be a Christian if I want to. If I don't want to be a Christian, I don't need to. Amen. Let me tell you, if you and I don't make a stand for God, you will not stand and you'll fall for everything. Remember, He made a stand for you. He made a stand for us. Why are we even so afraid to tell people you're a Christian? Well, I'm a, I, I kind of go to church. No, I don't kind of go to church. I am a believer. I am a Christian. I am a Christian. What, what have we, what, where has the world come to? Before the ceremony of the wedding, Damon and I were talking with the civil officers. They, they were in charge of those who were putting that, you know, the, the, talk about the whole, uh, all the civil procedures. And I was just listening to it. And you know, just just you know, I had to be there because after that I was doing the uh, the spiritual aspect of it. But they were just running the whole thing down to with uh, with Damon, and uh, and they made the statement. They said, "Well, usually in a wedding between a man and a woman, <laughs> my heart broke. It's sick." I know, I, I know the stuff that happens, but for me just to hear it uh, from, from, from the people who are doing it, is that usually in a wedding between a man and a woman. And what are the other usuals you have? It is a union between a man and a woman, period. That's what marriage is. It broke my heart. You know why it broke my heart? I'm thinking about a country that points to God. I'm not talking about any other God. I'm talking about Jehovah God. I'm talking about a country where the countries where missionaries came out and because of that, maybe not directly, but indirectly, maybe our forefathers were, were saved. They came to know Jesus Christ. They came to know the Lord. They sent missionaries. Because of that, we are Christians today. And today they are saying, well, in, 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 usually in a wedding of man and a woman. It is a marriage of man and woman. That's it. There's no other marriage. A marriage between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. It's not a marriage. It's called sin. Let me tell you, it happened in the day of. It's in the Bible itself. It's Sodom and Gomorrah. It happened. My heart broke. A country, even in their in, in their anthem, even in the, in what they in the first thing. God save our queen. God save our queen. God save us. God save us. It broke my heart. Just to hear those words from an audible voice. Where have some of the leading countries who are leading in the, bringing the gospel to the world, how far they've gone? They are between two opinions. If God, serve God. If you want to do all that stuff, then do that. If you think that's what marriage is, you want to be all liberal and do all that, then do that. Don't say we love God and say that no, we love this. God loves everybody. We understand that we're not talking about those things. God loves all of us. God loves the chief of sinners. God loves everybody. 
of what we stand for. We won't rain. It's time for us to stand up for the rain. The rain is a blessing of God. It's a blessing of God. I'm not going to get into the whole story because of a, it's a long story. But you see what happens is later on they cry out and they cut themselves and they, cry, they, they call the name of their God and the God doesn't show up. And all through the day until the noon time nothing happens. Later on Elijah comes in and, and of course and he calls on God and fire comes down from heaven. And God, God shows himself that he is God. And everybody bows up and worships him. But you see it's not that it's, it's now right now. And the interesting thing is much of the church is like Ahab. You know what Ahab does after that? He still doesn't believe God. Do you know that? Even until the end, he doesn't believe God. He sees the supernatural move of God. He first of all, even before that chapter 17, when Elijah said there will be no water at his word. He already, that's already a supernatural work of God. Later on, he sees this right here, you know, a, a fire from heaven. And, and he sees so many other so supernatural move of God, yet he doesn't believe. There are some people who just want to be around church, just want to be around Jesus, just want to be around Christianity, but never want to be a part of it. Just be around. Just being around church is not going to save you. Just being hanging around Jesus is not going to save you either. A lot of people who are around Jesus... Just to remind us, Judas was around Jesus for three and a half years. He was close to him. He was hanging out with Jesus the whole time. But yet, he missed out. Yet, he was not, didn't allow Jesus, to, you know, he allowed Jesus to change his life and transform his life. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter. We can be like Ahab, come to church, see the miraculous move of God, see supernatural signs and wonders, all that stuff take place. And yet, it's the same old, same old stuff. You want rain? Yes. You want rain? Yes. You need to stand up for the rain. Because that rain symbolizes God. It points to God. God will not waste his blessing on anybody. He will not. So we got to make up our mind, church. You got to make up your mind in your life. Husbands, make up your mind. Men, make up your mind. Wives, make up your mind. Children, make up your mind. Young people, make up your mind. Young people, make up your mind to live for God. Live a holy life. You know, one of the hardest things for young people to do is this. You know, what's the hardest thing for young people? Is to keep their life pure. And that's why in the book of Psalms, it tells us, Psalm 119, I believe, and, and, and was it 105? Or how can a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed of the word of God. To live pure, to live holy, is the hardest thing for a young person to do. To keep their body holy. But let me tell you, you make a stand for God. You give yourself to God. It's worth it all. It's worth it all. Give yourself to Him. Give all yourself to Him. Not just part of a Sunday to Him. Not just part of a day to Him. Give Him your all. I like what it says. It talks about, see, when you talk about Elijah, you can't help but to talk about John the Baptist. There's a correlation. In the book of Malachi, it talks about the spirit of Elijah will come forth. And that talks talk, talking about Eli, John the Baptist, who came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He's the counterpart of the New Testament. What Elijah was in the New Testament, or the Old Testament, New, uh, the New Testament is... Uh, is John the Baptist and I, I won't just want to read this what Jesus says about him in the, in the message Bible He says Luke 7 it says after John's messages left to make the report Jesus said more about John to the crowd of the people what did you expect when you went out to see in the wild a weakened camper hardly what then a shake in a silk pajamas not in the wilderness not by a long shot what then a messenger from God that's right, a messenger, probably the greatest messenger you will ever hear. He is the messenger Malachi announced when he wrote, I'm sending my messenger on ahead to make the road smooth for you. John the Baptist was, he was not a man pleaser. He was out there, he was a loner. He had no friends, but he didn't care about that. See, today, isn't it amazing? If you own a Facebook account, 
which is more commonly used, let me say that. Isn't it amazing that you have more friends than your father did? And I mean, I'm talking by a mile, by miles. How many friends did your father and mother have? I'm not talking about now with the Facebook or social media. How many friends can you remember your mom and dad had? 50 will be an exaggeration, correct? Is that, is that correct? I'm not talking about relatives who come on a, on to, a, to, to a function or a wedding. I'm talking about how many friends of your mom and dad you can remember? 20? That's, that's, a, that's quite, a, quite a lot, right? Three. But today we have like 250. <laughs> correct? We have, our children have like 2,000. Isn't that right? And they don't even know anybody. Because you like them, you like them. I mean, we, we call them friends. But how many of the friends that you have truly make a stand with you? How many of friends who will stand with you in the days of Elijah, not even one made a stand? Not even one meter stand. They were hiding in the cave. They were hiding. Today Christians were hiding inside the church. This is our man cave. This is the cave that we are in. You know that? I'm safe. I'm secure. And I'm all okay as far as I'm in this. Because if my praise is heard here. That's cool enough. That's good enough. But I want to make sure I'm not, nobody hears my praise when I'm at work. You know, you go to church and you go to work on Monday. It's a song that comes to your mind. Oh, the presence of God. Your presence, Lord. Oh, I would not be here. Man. See, do we want to be in this cave right here? As Obadiah hid those 50 P, 50 of the prophets on each cave. We want to keep our praise, our fellowship within this cave. Because you know what? There's safety in this cave. We won't be that offended and challenged in this. But once we leave our cave, we do not know what's going to happen. You want to see supernatural miracle of God take place? And the fire came from heaven? Make a stand for God. You want supernatural rain fall from heaven? Make a stand for God. You want to see the supernatural this as we pray, as we seek as a church, and upon the fasting and prayer? Make a stand. We want abundance of rain. Make a stand. I'm serious. If church is not working out for you and you want to be in both worlds, choose one world. Choose one. Don't come to Jesus, 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 and then tomorrow you go and call everything else apart from Jesus. <laughs> don't get religious on a Sunday. Don't. If you're religious, be religious a whole week. If you go to party, party all through the week. Don't just party on a Saturday night and Sunday try to be sober. Come on. And again, go, again get all, do the same thing right after church. See, Jesus came to this world not as a part-time warrior. Not as a part-time somebody who's going to die for us. He came to give us his all. Is there going to be struggle? Oh, yes. Will there be challenge? Oh, yes. Supernatural and the blessing of rain. The fire and the rain. Fire talks about the supernatural. The rain talks about God's provision. These two will only be experienced in God's proportion when we make a stand for God.